uh, hi. <laughs> um, so this poem is called The Decision Theory. Obsession theory has an epigraph. Um, noun, one, botany. The normal shedding of a senescent plant part or organ, e.g. old leaf or ripe fruit. Uh, two, zo zoology. The intentional separation of a body part, such as the separation of a tail or autotomy, usually as a protective evading mechanism against predators. I understood trees in mid-October, the way the cello prayed and wove itself through leaves, melody a critique of shadows outlined, in each vein drawing themselves in creases as breeze would rend their touching edges. I scraped myself awake to find the sidewalks littered with a moving day, curtains drawn open, Clouds inching from chapped mouths, light jackets, loose leaf trampled flat on concrete. A month beckoned and waited and smiled for me, shrugged, walked along, glanced back every so often. I have read theories of those who have poured the molten plastic of my body into a mold that sits upon a cedar shelf with an amethyst geode and trash morsels, painted into some muffled story, stale crumbs on a public floor, coils of jargon, stamped belts, shower rods, and sweatshirts around safety faucets. My folded shoulders, dry eyes fixed on black speckled laminate, quiet rooms, hallways, as peer-reviewed analysis, Distant collections of ink, blurred by snow, tinted breath, watching my mother die before she knew me. I understood the way soft necks adhered to the wood stock and drank light to their death. Red sandstone statements, fibrous phrases, drifting to earth as embers fall after the short shout of combustion. If my mother worried tenderly and does not now, her hands worry still over what a misaligned fork and brown napkin suggest. My hands have their fingertips bent to break the tense surface of a salty gulf. They worry over the shadows cast about the curves in my leaves, and the sentences scrawled over dirty tomes thrown from tongues behind nameplates. They trace the atonal grain in the wood of a New Jersey bar, counter-carved with grooves of all the selves that had stopped there, intricate tattoos drawn on a squirming corpse, rolled down a hot rural hill, forgotten. I smell myself as a term on the breath of the world, in my infant head that she let rest in her palm. It was washed and nothing, but she held it. Sutures now fused, a skull round, and tossed as a totem from thinker to thought to thinker and onto the pulp of what I understood in mid-October, etchings in mud that rot like a verbal history, all to make neat piles, give a proper address to my trembling obsession on the side of the road. So it's pretty long, so I'm just gonna read like the intro paragraph and then one of the body paragraphs. Um, Okay, so the title is um, To See Inside Her Heart, um, an Analysis of the Significance of Grandmothers in the Chicana Buildings Roman. Um, the significance of grandmother figures in the modern Buildings Roman hinges upon their ability to act as symbolic models by which granddaughters are able to fashion their identities. Grandmothers play crucial roles in Sandra Cisneros and Pam Munoz Ryan's respective modern Buildings Romaine, Caramello, and Esperanza Rising which feature grandmothers who are key figures in the lives of the protagonists and shape their differing experiences of growing up in Mexico and the United States. Annie O. Usteroy contextualizes the origins of the genre, stating the buildings Roman emerged within the particular social and intellectual context of 18th century Germany and has traditionally been defined as the somewhat autobiographical novel of formation, portraying a young man's development from innocence and, in and ignorance to maturity and knowledge, and that many Chicana narratives belong to the Buildings Roman genre. 
The development of specifically Chicana buildings Roman represents a shift in the genre because it deviates from the inclusion of a conventional male protagonist. The coming of age story within Chicano literature creates a space for the depiction of young female protagonists countering social oppression, which in this case can be seen as patriarchal repression inherent in both Mexican and American cultures. Usteroy points out the significance of social pressures, arguing the Buildings Roman portrays an individual growth process that posits an alternative model to prevailing perceptions of being. Society becomes the locus for experience and to some extent the antagonist of the Buildings Roman. In Caramello and Esperanza Rising, the protagonist's identities develop directly in response to external influences that limit their ability to seek individuality outside of the traditional values of the home, mainly because of the duties it considered reasonable of Mexican-American women. As Mexican-American and women, the granddaughters are oppressed by the limitations of both their gender and their ethnicity. This combination of social pressures makes the conflict between accepting and resisting tradition integral to Cisneros and Munoz Ryan's ca characterization of the girls' coming of age experiences. Okay, that was the that was long. That was an intro paragraph. Should I <laughs> read any more? I don't know. Um, I'll read a tiny bit more. Uh, so, um, one of the subtitles is "Awfulness as Female Agency in Sandra Cisneros' Car Caramello." Um, in Caramello, the defining characteristics of Celia's grandmother Soledad, her awfulness, stubbornness, and controlling nature, make her a powerful female role model capable of demonstrating agency and resistance. The first mention of Celia's grandmother marks her as the awful grandmother, and later she is described like the witch in that story of Hansel and Gretel. She likes to eat boys and girls. <coughs> Celia's awful grandmother, Soledad, is for most of the novel a, a figure of deep resentment in Celia's life, one she has a hard time coming to terms and identifying explicitly with, though they share many similarities, such as their close relationship with Celia's father, Soledad's firstborn and beloved son, Innocencio. Moreover, Soledad's common sayings are constantly negative, such as her overused, what a barbarity, to describe anything she disagrees with or dislikes. She is associated in many cases with the worst of Celia's childhood memories, as in when her beloved braids are chopped off and the grandmother scolds, saying, you should have seen the terrible things that happened to me as a girl, but did I cry? These qualities, though consistently perceived as negative by Celia, are what in the end makes Soledad a figure Celia can draw strength from in her resistance of patriarchy. As a grandmother, Soledad embodies strength and power by dominating the household through her words, beliefs, and actions. Okay, I'll stop there. It's long. <laughs> it's an essay. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to read a very quick excerpt from my story, Excellence in Sales. This is uh, the completely fictionalized uh, and very condensed history of a knife company that sells, like, you know, cutlery for bored housewives and house husbands. Um, so what's the story of American Cutlery? The story, yes, always the story. American Cutlery Co. was born from an honest commitment to quality cutlery in the summer of 1946. Following the end of World War II, Jonathan Johnny Spivy returned from his brave and honorable service in the mess halls of Europe to find the kitchens of his hometown of Babylon, New York, decimated by the steel rationing of the war. Depending on the interest of your audience, we suggest you share the charming anecdote of Jonathan's first dinner back in the States when his, mo when his mother's flimsy carving knife broke off in the roast and the expected hijinks ensued. Feel free to color the scene with additional details that develop real connections with your audience. Everyone's been there before. I remember when I was assigned to cut up the angel food cake one year, crush the whole cake with a dull blade, etc., etc. Determined to supply America with the quality cutlery it deserved, Johnny started American Cutlery Co. with only a low-interest loan and a dream. Veterans and their suburban aspirations were a huge potential demographic, and Johnny was determined to get an American Cutlery Co. set in every pastel laminate kitchen in the country. He came damn close. By 1955, the company was outpacing Tupperware 3 to 1, inspiring Americans that they were cut from the best stuff on earth, American steel later altered to a cutaway from the crowd in a popular string of ad spots during the 60s wherein a disgruntled and clearly counterculture teen saw his parents' status quo sedan in half with a Santuco slicer. The mother, in a twist of fate, was thrilled about the knife's sharpness. Really, none of this is essential. It's mostly important to impress the aura of quality and America onto your audience. We are the single most dependable and popular supplier of high-quality cutlery in the Western Hemisphere, and a close second in the Eastern. Make sure to say that twice if you have to. In 1983, following almost three decades of growth in the American imagination as the only honest cutlery manufacturer, Jonathan Spivy Jr. sold his father's beloved business to Vector Holdings, an international conglomerate interested in capturing a share of the global knife market. 
There's no need to mention Spivy Sr.'s eventual descent into dementia in the late 70s and the tangle of leading proce legal proceedings that led to Spivy Jr.'s assuming the role of CEO before the passing of his father. Dementia does not sell knives. 1983 was the birth of American cutlery as you know it today. We have grown our offerings to include over 204 different kitchen utensils, and we have offices in over 130 countries where we're remaining an independent subsidiary of Vector Holdings, but we are still dedicated to quality above all else. That's it.